to speak normally. Okay, let's see. This will be a test. One, two, three. This is what I suppose I'll be talking uh, as I answer your questions. Or maybe you'll, maybe I'd go a little bit louder, probably like this. Okay. 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 You want me to talk to you? Okay. First, can you start out by telling me, uh, tell me your name, okay. where you live, uh -huh. and what you do? Okay. My name is Darwin Payne. I live in... <laughs> Just the city is fine. Oh, okay. My <laughs> name is Darwin Payne. I live in Dallas, Texas. Uh, I'm a retired professor at Southern Methodist University. Where were you born? I was born in uh, Van Zandt County, Texas, which is about 55 miles southeast of Dallas. And then I came to Dallas when I was six months old. So I've lived here since I was six months old, except for a few little periods, college, army, and working in Fort Worth for three years for the Fort Worth Press. Where'd you go to college? I went to the University of Texas at Austin. <clears throat> got a bachelor's degree in journalism there. And then <clears throat> I went to SMU, got a Master of Arts in History, then back to the University of Texas for a PhD in American Civilization. Well, the first time I went in the Army, I was there for six months. I was part of the National Guard. Went to Fort, Polk, Fort Knox, Kentucky. And then I was recalled to active duty in 1961 when the Berlin Wall went up. And so that time I spent uh, just short of one year. Did you just stay here or did you have to go? No, I went to Fort Polk, Louisiana for that term. Yeah. And uh, you've worked as a journalist. Well, I started, yes, I, after I got out of the University of Texas with a bachelor's degree, I, I went to work uh, at the Fort Worth Press and worked as a reporter and editor there. And then I moved over to the Dallas Times-Herald in, in uh, 1963 and worked at the Times-Herald through 1965. Uh, I had another one-year stint at the Times-Herald working on the copy desk. And then I worked for a year full-time in television on the old newsroom show on Channel 13, which Jim Lehrer started, and then worked part-time on it for another year. And then, aside from that, I taught at uh, Southern Methodist University. Yeah, I heard that that newsroom show was pretty influential. And it was. A very influential show. Had a lot of good people on it, and we covered the news in uh, a little more in-depth than the television commercial stations did. I taught for right about 30 years, and so I retired five years ago, and I still teach a course every other semester in Dallas history. And uh, Michael Hazel was one of your students at one time, wasn't he? Yes, he was. He was an undergraduate when I was, uh, when I was first teaching at SMU. Mike Hazel was. And now you've written a book together, correct? I published a book that he wrote. And we've written one together, that's right. We did recently uh, Dallas, uh, Dynamic Dallas, uh, an illustrated history, and Mike did all the photographs for it, and I did the written words. Yeah, so we did that one together. And then I published another book as a publisher. I have a little publishing company, and I did his book, uh, Dallas Reconsidered, a collection of essays, which he edited, and he wrote a lot of the essays. And then what books have you also written? I've written... A number of books. Uh, recently I've written a, a, several books on Dallas history. I did uh, Big D, uh, Triumphs and Troubles of an American Super City in the 20th Century, which was a review uh, or, or history of the uh, 20th century. I did uh, a book, A History of Lawyers in Dallas, about lawyers, how they impacted the city and the Dallas Bar Association through the, throughout its history. I did a history of uh, aviation in Dallas, primarily on DFW Airport. And aside, aside from that, I've done, the uh, first book I did was a biography of Frederick Lewis Allen, who is editor of Harper's Magazine and a prominent historian as well. I did a biography of Owen Wister, who wrote The Virginian and other books, and that was a book in 1903 that uh, introduced the cowboy as a popular cultural hero to American life, and, and it was the, it sort of created this uh, culture in which the cowboy was a hero. 
and uh, a couple of other books I've edited. But those are the, and I'm just finishing a book right now, by the way, on Sarah T. Hughes, the federal judge who was here for so long and who swore in Lyndon Johnson on Air Force One and did any number of other things. So what is it that you like about Dallas so much? Well, primarily I like Dallas a lot because I, I grew up here, <laughs> I'll be honest. <laughs> and, and of course, it's been a good place for me. I mean, I have family here, friends, of course. And, uh, and it seems to me that it does have a lot of advantages. It's a good place to live. Uh, it's very conveniently located within the United States, and it's convenient to live here if, uh, to get around in Dallas as well. So, uh, so I like it, yes, I like it a lot. And I think it has an interesting history, too, that a lot of people don't recognize. And it's, it's conceived of as a town, a recent town, that not much ever happened to here. But the truth is, it's, it has a pretty interesting history. Um, do you have any political affiliation? I don't have a, an affiliation. <laughs> I have uh, I voted for both parties. I must tell you, recently I am, uh, I would have to say I'm a Democrat. <laughs> Although I have, I certainly have voted for Repu Republican presidents. Um, go back to uh, kind of the beginning of Dallas mm -hmm. and how it started and what now is possible. Right. Well, Dallas uh, got its very beginning right there at Dealey Plaza. Uh, there was a crossing of the Trin Trinity River. And the river, of course, was located right near the Old Red Courthouse. Now, it would be located at the, at the triple underpass. When you go into the triple underpass, at that low spot, that's where the original bank of the Trinity would be. Well, there was a bluff there that's now cut down uh, at, by Dealey Plaza. And uh, on that bluff, John Neely Bryan came in 1841 and figured he would start a town. And he thought that was a good crossing point on the Trinity. It had a limestone base, and you had good footing to get across. The floodplain was not too wide at that point. Uh, it, it, it widens as you go up the river and down the river, and it narrowed at this point at Dallas. He thought there was going to be a national highway there. The Republic of Texas had announced a national highway, in, in, in fact, that would go up to some point on the Red River. And he figured it would cross at Dallas. And moreover, he saw the Trinity River. He saw navigation on the Trinity River, coming about as far as Dallas from the Gulf of Mexico, and going no further than that. Then turning around and going back. So he thought Dallas was the logical place for a turning basin. Uh, and he thought the, Dallas, the the city would grow. So he settled here. Unlike many other settlers, he didn't come to farm. He came to found a city. And so that's what he did uh, in 1841. Marked as his, as his? That cabin uh, that's located near the Dealey Plaza for years was marked as his original cabin in Dallas, but the truth is it's not. And in fact, the last time I looked, they changed the marking on it, so it just says it's an early cabin now. The cabin likely was built by a man named Gideon Pemberton, uh, and, and the Pemberton family still lives in, in the Dallas area, but, but that's recent thought that Pemberton may have built that cabin. How did the city of Dallas get its name? Well, uh, the way Dallas got its name is very interesting, and the, in fact, nobody knows. What, what we do know is that John Neely Bryan uh, was asked about it, or was quoted as having been asked about it, and said that he named it for his friend Dallas. Now, who that was, we don't know. It could have been Alexander Dallas, who was a Commodore in the U.S. Navy. It could have been George Mifflin Dallas, his brother, who was uh, a lawyer in Philadelphia. But, and for a long time it was thought that it was named after George Mifflin Dallas, but on reflection you find that George Mifflin Dallas in 1841 or 1842, about the time that uh, Brian gave it the name Dallas, was, uh, he wasn't known. He became vice president with James K. Polk uh, in 1845, but, but it's unlikely that John Neely Bryan could have known him before that time or, or even known of him until he became vice president. Uh, it is more likely that he knew his brother Alexander uh, who, Dallas uh, because of his naval exploits. And since Brian wanted, wanted Dallas to be a city with navigation as a central point, uh, we thought maybe, maybe he picked Alexander Dallas. But the truth is there are a couple of other stories as well and nobody knows. Now the county itself 
having been formed in 1846, was named specifically for George Mifflin Dallas. I think there might have been thought to naming it uh, Polk after uh, President Polk, but uh, there were other places with that name, and so I, perhaps they went for George Mifflin. And since the town was already named Dallas, then they thought they'd name the county Dallas as well. But, but the documentation of that is non-existent, really. Uh, Although we do know it was named for him for, as vice president of the county, but the city we don't know. Can you tell me a, kind of a story of Colonel Bilo? Well, A.H. Bilo was, uh, of course, the, headed the, the, uh, the Galveston News in Galveston, the most influential newspaper in the state. And uh, he had determined that uh, the Northeast Texas area was growing rapidly and he wanted to uh, start a newspaper in this area. So he sent G.B. Dealey, who had come over from England as a boy, and G. B. George Bannerman Dealey uh, worked there at the Galveston newspaper. He sent him up to this area to scout a likely location for a second newspaper, or in effect a branch newspaper. Dealey traveled all over this area and then concluded that Dallas would be the best place for the newspaper, and so he went back and reported that to Colonel Bilo, who I think sat on that news for a little bit, maybe a couple of years, and then came, uh, then established the Dallas Morning News here in 18, October 1st, 1885, as a full-fledged modern newspaper, and some have said that it's an example of, uh, uh, an early example of a newspaper chain being a, a part of the Galveston Daily News, although it did have the Dallas Morning News, as as its name. Um, what about uh, Bilo's like early history, like his Civil War? You know, I, the truth is, I'm unfamiliar with his early Bilo's early history. That's okay. Okay. Uh, what about Dealey? Why, do you know why his family came here from England? I don't know why his family came from England. I hope that Judith Segura and Mike <laughs> they've worked with Bilo Corporation and they know those answers. But I, <laughs> I've never gone into that. Uh, another person I talked to, which I have been warned by several people it's not that reliable, is Jerry Dealey. Oh, yeah, I know Jerry Dealey, yeah. yeah I'm sure you probably have met him. I have met him, yeah. yeah. I think it's interesting because of his personal story. Right, yeah. Yeah, I've never had an occasion really to go into, uh, it's an interesting story, I know, and I have read uh, secondary works on it, but I can't remember any details about Bilo's family or why George Bannerman Dealey came over to this country. I think he was just a young, pretty young when he came over. Yeah, I was told uh, 11. 11, uh-huh. Um, did you know the name of Dealey when you were growing up in Dallas? Yes, I did know the Dealey name, because when I was growing up in Dallas, uh, I was very interested in newspapers, and from a early, pretty early age, wanted to be a newspaper reporter. So I read both the Dallas Morning News and the Dallas Times Herald, and Dealey was, uh, of course, he died in, what, 46, and uh, I was nine years old in 46, so I, I, I shouldn't say that I was very conscious of his name at that age, but Shortly thereafter, I certainly was aware of it, and I may have been at the age of nine even when he died. I, d I don't recall his death, though. But I read the, both newspapers pretty carefully and, and uh, aspired to a career here in Dallas on a newspaper. Do you remember people talking about Dealey, or did you, was it information that you sought out? Uh, I never, I don't remember people really talking much about Dealey. I mean, you, I mean recently after his death, perhaps, and uh, in other days. I only know of people talking about him uh, since I've become a mature individual interested in Dallas history, and then of course you hear people talk uh, uh, frequently about Dealey and his importance, his influence in Dallas, and certainly I uh, tried to look into his career to, to a great degree to see about that. And what's your impression of the man after research? I thought he was a very honorable, straightforward, a uh, dignified gentleman with uh, high hopes for Dallas. So he, had, he had selected this site for the Dallas Morning News. Colonel Bilo had sent him here to work with the Dallas Morning News from the very beginning, and so he felt uh, 
a certain uh, ownership of it, and he wanted the city, he wanted to, to the city to prosper, and he wanted his newspaper to prosper. So from the very beginning, he wasn't the publisher of the newspaper at the beginning, but he was the business manager for many years. He wanted the newspaper to do well. He involved himself in civic activities, and uh, under his leadership, uh, and under his, uh, for the many years that he was associated with the newspaper, he pushed for civic improvements. And, uh, well, especially like the uh, Trinity River Project, moving the Trinity from its original site near the Triple Underpass out between levees. And he was very instrumental in getting uh, George Kessler to be the city planner, to hire him to, to come up with the city plan. And he worked with Kessler considerably. He recognized at an early date, sometime probably 19... 10, 1912, he was, uh, and you perhaps have heard this story, he was at the uh, smoking a cigar at lunch, and he had walked down to the river and looked over at that wasteland, because it was a wasteland, and the river was a barrier for the expansion of the city in that direction. And he looked out over that land, and right behind him was the town, which, which was thriving, and he saw uh, this wasted floodplain land, and he thought, one day that land will be valuable. And... Uh, it would have been before 1980, because it was before, well, not necessarily before 1980, it was before the Kessler Plan came about, which was 1912. And he looked over that land and thought, uh, it will be valuable one day. And he went to the courthouse and tried to find out who owned some of that property. And he determined to buy some of the property himself. That's all right. Okay. Uh, 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 do you want to start over? Get away no. from your kitty. Good no. gummit. Uh, It'll be good for the documentary, <laughs> especially after I take a drink of the water after the cat. Uh, he, he determined to try to find out who owned some of that property. He was unable to, but he wanted to be anonymous about it. So he went to the courthouse, started looking up records, couldn't, couldn't determine it, and he got a friend to do the search for him. And he did find out who owned a lot of that property, and in the next several years he bought, oh, maybe... 30 acres of the property, thinking that its value would be enhanced in years to come. And then, of course, he used his influence as, uh, at the Dallas Morning News to bring in George Kessler, for Kessler to come up with a city plan, and, uh, and he agreed with Kessler that the major part of the plan was removing the Trinity River from its position right adjacent to town out into the middle of the floodplain and to separate it with levees so the city would be protected from flooding. And, of course, that came about. Uh, they started doing that in the late 1920s. It took a long time for that to come about. But at the beginning of that project, George Bannerman Dealey spoke. And, and at that time, he talked about how he had uh, conceived of that idea that the land would one day be valuable. And the project went on for several years, of course. And, uh, and he was so intimately involved with it that they named uh, Dealey Plaza after him when it was completed. And what did he end up doing with that? He had to sell that land as they, uh, or he, he did sell the land as they worked on the levee, and he did not make, I understand, huge profits from it at all. Um. I must add this, though. He, uh, of course, that land did become valuable. And if you're in Dallas now, you can see it, like Industrial Boulevard, the Brick Holland Industrial District, that entire uh, industrial area along Stimmons Freeway w was uh, reclaimed from the floodplain. And that land did become very valuable, of course. Um, Dealey worked up until his death. Mm -hmm. I believe he did, yes. Do you know anything about the day he died? Or? I'm afraid I don't know anything about the day he died, no. Yeah. He, uh, is he at all a political figure? Well, uh... I guess he was political. I haven't, uh, the editorial page of the Morning News during his time there would have been Democratic. Everybody was a Democrat in Texas in those days, virtually everybody. And so they took Democratic positions. Uh, it was a fairly moderate newspaper, I would say. Uh, and he did, he was involved in the drive to, to push out the Ku Klux Klan from Dallas, which had got a foothold here in the early 1920s. He was very much opposed to that. Now, it was after his death that the newspaper turned uh, considerably uh, 
to the right and became ultra conservative by the time of the uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy's visit here in 1963. But during Dealey's tenure, the newspaper was a progressive newspaper actually and fought for many progressive ideals. Not, not to say that it was a, in a progressive party, but a lowercase progressive newspaper. Was uh, the Dealey Plaza project at all affiliated with the New Deal work? Yes. There were a lot of New Deal, uh, there was a considerable New Deal effort in the Dealey Plaza in, in, in the building of it, say from 1935, 36 to 1940, and uh, WPA. But it was largely a city and county project, but the Works Progress Administration was involved, and also the National Youth Administration. And the National Youth Administration was that group of young people who were working, and the, the head of that was none other than, than Lyndon Johnson who had been appointed by uh, Franklin Roosevelt so, to head that operation. And so you can say President Johnson was somewhat involved, or, or, or we won't call him Johnson at that time, not President, was somewhat involved in uh, the creation of Dealey Plaza, rather indirectly. I'm sorry, Jim. How was, what was Dealey's reaction when he was told that they wanted to name this after him? Uh, I understand, but this is hearsay, and this is just my memory, that he did not want that to happen. But I, I may be wrong on that. I wouldn't want to be authoritative at all, so I don't really know. I know that a couple of years after his death, of course, they put the statue out in there, and it was, uh, since he'd been tied into the project for so long, uh, the other people wanted it named for him. Yes. But, uh, quite the memorial to him. It is a good memorial to him. Is there any uh, features of Dealey's character that would surprise people or anything that, the details of? Well, uh, I don't suppose there's anything surprising uh, about him. Uh, at all. I think he was just uh, what he appeared to be, a you know, very uh, straightforward, uh, upstanding individual who was pretty uh, formal in his appearance and, and, and personality. Uh, what about his relations with his children? You know, well, I'm, I don't, I'm not sure, to tell you the truth. I wouldn't be able to speak with any authority on that. Yeah. You know how his I think Ted, his son, Ted, uh, uh, just was the normal successor to his father. And, uh, I'm, I'm, and, and under Ted, it became uh, considerably more conservative than it had been under his dad. And Ted had been trained in all aspects of the newspaper. He'd been a reporter, and then I think had worked in other departments and became the successor to his father because the family by then owned the newspaper. The family had bought the newspaper, or George Bannerman Dealey had bought the majority control of the newspaper in the 1920s. Until that time, it, of course, was owned by the Galveston Daily News and the Belo Corporation. Uh, but so the family had taken control and the family could do what they wanted to. And even since that day, family members have been in charge of the Dallas Morning News. You know the story about Ted Dealey going to, going to Washington, D.C. and consulting the president? No, I think that was Joe Dealey. Joe Dealey? I think so. That Joe, I, 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 could, I could be wrong on this. You think it's Ted? Yeah. You sure? Yeah. Ted Dealey. Because Joe's the grandson that came after. Right. Ted. Okay, if it was Ted Dealey, what? Uh, well, we'll start. I know that story about Ted. I, I, uh, well, of course, uh, I'm going to hedge by saying Mr. Dealey here. <laughs> I'll wait for this thing to stop. <laughs> well, when uh, uh, Dealey, a number of newspaper publishers were invited to the White House probably in early 63, might have been 62, 
And President Kennedy was uh, under a lot of, taking a lot of heat at the time from uh, people, conservative people all over the country. And uh, Dealey went there and told him at the, at the end of a luncheon that, Mr. President, the people of this country need a strong leader. And you've been out there riding on Caroline Kennedy's tricycle. We want somebody on a horseback, something like that. And he seemed to have insulted him in, in his own house after being invited there for a social occasion. Now, I understand the other publishers were aghast, and a lot of people were aghast, and, and there's quite a flap over that, a lot of newspaper articles, and it got a lot of attention in the nation's press. But it was part of the uh, right-wing atmosphere that we saw here in uh, Dallas uh, at the time, and the, and the Dallas Morning News by then was aiding and abetting the ultra-right in, in their uh, conservative efforts. And so is there any conflict within the the news as far as, because at one point they had been fighting the Klan and now? The, the, the Klan fight uh, had taken place so many years before the 1960s that there was really no connection, but of course, and the newspaper had done about a 180 degree loop by that time. And I might say the Klan fight, uh, as interesting as it was, and as much credit as George B. Dealey gets for it, and he deserves all that credit, he did not jump into that with both feet. Uh, in fact, there was an editorial writer on the newspaper who had seen the Klan parade, uh, on perhaps the first parade at night. The next day, he wrote a fiery editorial against the Klan. George Bannerman Dealey saw that editorial in the newspaper and was somewhat surprised. He did not know it was going to appear. He walked into the editorial writer's office and told him, that was a pretty good editorial in the paper this morning, but don't you think you ought to be check with me before you set out on a new editorial ground? He was a little bit concerned about, about the impact of that because a lot of prominent people in Dallas were members of the Klan. But the, the, but the path that had already been laid out, the anti-Klan path, Dealey had been pulled into it in that way, and thereafter he was, he was very supportive of it. Uh, and, and the Dallas Morning News continued to fight the Klan in its editorial pages. They took a, a brief break from that when the Klan showed its dominance. Uh, a couple of years later, there was an organized effort to, get, to dismantle the Klan. It failed. And the Klan elected the slate to the city council. And uh, at that time, I think the Dallas Morning News sort of gave up on the fight f for a, a couple of years. And then the Klan started, it became vulnerable, say 1925 or so, some things happened, and the Morning News jumped back in with both feet and, uh, and led the drive against the Klan and has received a lot of credit. And in fact, the news almost went under because of the, its battle against the Klan. It was quite a courageous fight, uh, and the Klan led a boycott against the Morning News so that uh, trying to get advertisers to stop advertising in the news it uh, stopped news dealers from handling the news. The news suffered a lot of, lost a lot of circulation, lost a lot of advertising revenue. And by this time, the news was the dominant paper over the Galveston News. And this is when the news sold the Galveston News to get some extra cash. And that perhaps tidied them over and managed them to, and helped them to survive this uh, boycott by the Klan. When when did Dallas Morning News become the only big paper around? Well, the Dallas Morning News, for many years, there were, there were like four newspapers in Dallas. And you had the Dallas Morning News that had its afternoon edition called the Dallas Journal. There was a, and this would be the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s. The Dallas Times Herald, and then there was the Dallas Dispatch. In the early 1940s, the Dispatch and the Journal disappeared. And from that point on, it was a battle between the Dallas Times-Herald, an afternoon newspaper, and the morning news. And the Dallas Times-Herald went out of business. Ultimately, uh, it decided, I forget the years now, it might have been in the, I guess in the 1980s, it, it had new ownership, the LA Times owned the newspaper, and they decided to go head to head against the Dallas Morning News in the morning market. The afternoon newspapers were having problems. And so, in that battle, the news was so, was dominant and the Times-Herald lost and ultimately, and soon, of course, disappeared. 
And at that time, Dallas became a one, one newspaper town. Can you tell me about the restoration efforts on Old Red? Well, the Old Red Courthouse, uh, of course, built, opened 1891. Uh, and over the years, had, uh, I mean, that's a pretty old building, had begun to deteriorate. And uh, I forget the year, probably in the 1980s again, it's when, when they stopped doing any business at all in the Old Red Courthouse. And uh, a few years after that, they did some renovations to it, trying to restore it. And uh, and then nothing much happened as a result of that. And then a few years ago, of course, uh, they started redoing it again. And uh, the first floor now has been redone. You have the Dallas Visitor Center on the first floor. And the second floor will contain the, uh, the Old Red Museum uh, of Dallas history, Dallas County history and culture. And so that, that is scheduled to open maybe in about two years in 2005 probably, perhaps late 2004. And then the upper floor is maybe there'll be one courtroom that's, that'll be renovated and they'll hold court in that courtroom. Maybe a visiting judge or something like that. So um, what all will be dealt with in, the, in that museum? In the Dallas History Museum? Yeah. Dallas County? Well, that museum will include things, uh, the entire history of the county. And it's county commissioners and uh, Dallas Historical Commission. Uh, I'm not sure the name of the organization, uh, although I'm part of it. Uh, is uh, I mean they've they've worked to restore it and they're raising money and a considerable amount of money has already been raised to do this. Uh, and uh, I forget exactly what your what was your question again? Just what it's going to do. With. What it's going to do that? What will the history museum do? Yes. The History Museum uh, will cover the entire second floor. It'll try to, to talk about the history of Dallas County and even the earlier days. I mean, it'll, t it'll have, we hope, fossils uh, and, and a lot of things about prehistory of this area. And then it'll, it'll have quadrants, the first segment being uh, the history up until 1873 when the second railroad came to town. Then we'll go from 1873 to 1918, I believe is the year, talking about Dallas as a regional trade center. Then we'll have a third quadrant would be 1918 to 1945, when Dallas becomes Big D. It'll talk about that aspect of the history. And then the last part would be 1946 to the present, Dallas becoming a world crossroads. The fact that it's become a city that's very it has a lot of corporations that have worldwide, worldwide enterprises, and some of the homegrown businesses are, are international now, too. So all those things, and we hope to have uh, audiovisuals, we'll have photographs, uh, artifacts, uh, children's center, ed children's educational center in which children can do various interactive games to learn about the history of the Dallas County. And we hope to include not just the city of Dallas, but uh, the various county towns. We want it to be all inclusive, and it'll it'll touch on controversial su just subjects too. It's not just a uh, a uh, public relations piece for Dallas. It'll go into the 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 unfortunate parts of history that have occurred to the 1860 burning of the town, in which slaves were blamed for that. Uh, go into the Ku Klux Klan, the lynching of a man from the courthouse in 1910. Uh, that, well, in 1910, there was a black man named Brooks who was arrested and charged with a sexual assault on a white child that occurred behind her house at uh, Ross and St. Paul, right in that area. Now, it was uh, not really too urbanized at that time. It's about where the uh, Catholic Church is and the Belo Mansion now are located. And he had been arrested, and of course there was uh, a lot of concern about this among the public, and there was a lynch attitude. And uh, news newspaper headlines were pretty brutal, talking about how awful the crime was. And so a mob gathered uh, outside the Old Red Courthouse when he uh, was brought to trial. And uh, on the first day of the trial, 
and police were summoned to, to help the deputy sheriffs protect the courtroom and the courthouse. But the mob was so big that it overpowered them, broke into the courtroom. Uh, some of them had a rope. They put a rope around uh, Alan Brooks' neck, threw the rope down to the people on the ground uh, beneath. They pulled him out of the, that second floor window on the southwest corner and uh, pulled him down. He hit on his head. People jumped on him with a knife and uh, you know, stabbed him. And, the, and perhaps he was dead already. We would, we would, mercifully, I would hope he was dead at that point because his body, he was dragged by the rope up to the center of town to uh, Main and uh, Main and Ackard Street. And uh, he was hanged there from a utility pole, his body was. And crowds gathered. They stripped him of his clothing and took them as souvenirs. And there's one photograph of that, of him hanging from that utility pole. So it was, a, and there was a grand jury investigated to see if he could identify the people who, were in, who did that, uh, some of the green leaders. All the deputies testified, police officers, nobody would s testify that they had uh, seen anybody that they recognized. So nothing was ever done about it, although the grand jury did investigate it, but, but never charged anyone with it. So that was one of the seamier uh, episodes of Dallas history. Another lynching had occurred at the site of Dealey Plaza so the, the lynching, the, the hanging of Brooks, I mean the pulling of him from the courthouse window occurred right there at Dealey Plaza. 1860 when the town burned, uh, slaves were blamed for that, interrogations were held, and three slaves were identified as the guilty parties, and those three were hanged as well right there at, uh, on the banks of the Trinity River at Dealey Plaza. Whether they were guilty or not, it was a vigilante mob that, that held uh, like a kangaroo court and determined that these three were guilty. It was not a court of uh, a recognized court. And so uh, they were hanged. Did they, uh, I heard that they kicked some people out of town for that too. Yes, there were abolitionist uh, ministers, Methodists, who had been here, and they thought that these abolitionist preachers had inspired them to do it and had conceived of this huge plot because there were fires in, in other towns in this area on the same day. Uh, and so it was very mysterious. Uh, there's an interesting... Quarterly, I think 1946 or 47, which details all those fires. For a long time, it was thought that the slaves could not have done that, that it was accidental. And perhaps it was thought because uh, it, was, it was in times when you didn't think the slaves had the uh, ability to organize in that, in that sense and do that. But I think more recent thought is when you have all those fires breaking out at the same time, not exactly the same time, the same day, and then others breaking out in that week in other parts of the state. Uh, it looks like it's more than a coincidence to me. Um, and tell me what you thought of Kennedy when he was president. Well, I was an admirer of Kennedy. Uh, I, John Kennedy was the first person I was able to vote for, the first presidential candidate I could vote for. So I cast my ballot for him and uh, thought he was a, a very important person and I admired him and uh, supported him very much and uh, was, was uh, along with other people however I was concerned about his safety when he, when he came to Dallas on November 22nd 1963. And what was your job in 63? Well I was a re newspaper reporter at the Dallas Times Herald I had just come there about two or three months before from the Fort Worth Press, and my normal job was general assignments. I did general assignments, and two days a week I would cover the police station when the police reporter would have his days off. And uh, so on the very day that Kennedy came, however, I was assigned to the rewrite desk. And uh, everybody on the newspaper had a specific job on that day because the visit was so important, and, was, and uh, we wanted to give full coverage. So I was on the rewrite desk, and my job there was to get information from two people who were out on the, on the scene. One was uh, a woman who was at uh, Love Field, and the other was going to be at the trademark where he was to speak. And so I was taking notes from these people and writing a story about Jackie Kennedy. They were observing Jackie and to see how she was dressed, how she reacted to the crowd, that sort of thing. And I'd gotten notes from the first reporter at Love Field and was trying to write up a tentative lead 
on the story. In fact, I had written a lead on the story, and I was going to get more from the other reporter at the trademark. Uh, but but the newspaper had held up its deadline, and so we were already past the deadline. So we were rushing things through as quickly as we could. And uh, it was about that time as I was working on the story that our city editor was in communications with the police reporter who was monitoring the police radio. And uh, and I heard the police, the city editor say, stand up suddenly, very alarmed and said, they're sending uh, ambulance and police to the triple underpass or Dealey Plaza, code three. And uh, and then as he got more from the police reporter, he's been hit. Nobody knew for sure. What do you mean he's been hit? I asked the city editor, Is it, was he hit with a picket sign or what with? Well, it was, he'd been shot. And so, uh, and shots had been fired, that was realized. And so at that moment, uh, the city editor asked me and another reporter named Paul Rosenfield to go to Dealey Plaza and see what we could find out. So uh, we immediately left the newspaper office, which was about five or six blocks away, and got there as quickly as we could on foot, thinking we might have trouble parking. So we thought we'd just run down there. We did and found, uh, started interviewing people eyewitnesses, trying to find out what had happened, talking to police officers who were there. And uh, so it was uh, pretty hectic. What kind of things were people coming? Well, uh, I found people, uh, first thing I did was to find, uh, uh, this is a typical reporter stunt. I remember the first thing I did, and I just reviewed notes the other day that I took at the time and sort of put them together. First thing I did is I saw somebody I knew, a TV reporter. Generally, I said, tell me what's happened here. And the TV reporter said, well, they think the shots came from this building, et cetera, et cetera. Then I went to a police officer to see what the situation was there. Yes, the building had been sealed. No, I couldn't go into the school book depository. They were in there now looking and seeing what they could do. Then there were people on the street. I went to people, anybody I could find on the street. Were you here when it happened? Uh, what did you see? And people told me, people were horrified, of course. There was a lot of emotion, very visible emotion uh, at that time. You had police officers, a large number of police officers. You had a fire truck there. You had policemen running around with uh, rifles in their hands, shotguns. I, I expected myself that there would be a shootout, that they would encounter the person who had done the shooting somewhere in the back of the school book depository and uh, likely they would have to exchange shots to get, I sort of imagine that in my mind. Some of the people told me, uh, several of the women said their boss had taken film of it. And I was very, uh, of course, I said, who was he? Where is he? Let me see if I can talk to him. I thought it would be very good. I knew it would be. <laughs> and uh, so they said it was Abraham Zabruder. And he was in the very next building and they led me to Abraham Zabruder's office. And of course he had taken that famous Zabruder film. And I, I talked to Mr. Zabruder. He was distraught, a Kennedy supporter, in tears himself much of the time that I talked to him. Told him that we could take the uh, film to the Times Herald, get it developed, and see what was in it. See if it was good. We would like to get stills from it to put in the newspaper. And uh, we would pay him. I, I, he wanted to give it to the Secret Service, however. And, uh, and he didn't want to give it to me or to the Times Herald. I called, and I was in communication with the city desk at the Times Herald, telling them what I was seeing on the outside, outside the school book depository, just because I could see from the window. And, I, and he had a television set, Mr. Zabruder had a TV set on in the office, we could watch the, the network news at the same time. And I talked to the publisher of the newspaper. I'd never met him, but I talked to him to tell him what I had. And so he, he got on the line with Zabruder and told him we would pay him for this uh, film. and. Uh, he, uh, but he would not do that. Uh, he didn't want to do it. And, and Mr. Chambers uh, didn't say how much he would pay him either. But ultimately, the uh, Secret Service did come in. And, uh, and I guess the breeder had called them. They came in and they took him into a room there with, uh, and, uh, and I started walking in the room as well. And I had seen that there was a reporter with them. Harry McCormick of the Dallas Morning News, a veteran police reporter, uh, sort of a legendary reporter. And so uh, I started walking in the room too and said, no, who are you? And I told them and they said, well, you can't come in here. This is, you know, this police business. And I said, well, Mr. McCormick is there. If he's there, I have to be there. And so they told McCormick to leave the room 
and so I got McCormick out. <laughs> then they left the building and uh, and and I lost track of them. I tried to follow them out of the building. I was going to go with them wherever they went, and uh, they got on one elevator. I didn't get on that one. I couldn't, you know, and I, I lost track of them. I went back to the school book depository then, and by then, uh, they about that time they decided to let reporters into the building. And uh, there'd been a couple in there early on who had been there accidentally, sort of Kent Biffle and Pierce Allman and, and uh, another cameraman. But I had uh, not, but now they let anybody in, any reporter who wanted to go in. So I was taken through the building, went up to the, where the Oswald uh, was and saw where he'd barricaded himself and, and uh, looked out the window and all that. And uh, after that, I uh, went back to the newspaper. Uh, it was late afternoon by then. The editions were finished. We'd you know, done, we'd done several editions, and I went back to the newspaper. And uh, the city editor came to me and said they'd they'd learned where that Lee Harvey Oswald had been arrested. I, I had heard that, by the way. I knew that, and they had his address. And so I went to Lee Harvey Oswald's rooming house, which was over in Oak Cliff, 1026 North Beckley and interviewed uh, people who lived in that rooming house and the woman in charge of it, uh, officials, law enforcement officials who were there and got a lot of information there. And went back to the office and tried to do it and did write a profile of Oswald for the next day's newspaper. There was a lot of wire copy by then, my notes, other notes, and I put them together for the story in the Saturday edition of the Times Herald. working on the story, and you didn't see as much of the television coverage as everybody else was. That's right. I did not, since I was, except for the time that I spent in Abraham's a Bruder's office, I did not watch television that day. Uh, I think late at night, I must have gotten home 11 or so that night, maybe 12, maybe 1 a.m., I, I don't know. Uh, maybe I watched some television then. And then Saturday, I did watch television, though, the next day and, and saw the mob scene at the police station. As it happened, on that Saturday night was my regular day to go to the police station. So at 5 o'clock, I went to the police station and saw uh, this, this unusual scene, of the floor, third floor where the press room was, where I normally worked out of the press room, was packed with reporters from all over the country and all over the world by then. So it was quite a sight and, and very, uh, very hectic, very hectic. And so Oswald was brought back and forth a couple of times out of the homicide office for interrogation. You had uh, uh, officials giving brief press conferences and talking about what they had learned. And so uh, that was quite a hectic evening for me. Do you remember at what point during that day you heard that the president was pronounced dead? Yes, that, of course, on Friday. I think when I was in, uh, I feel quite certain when I was in Mr. Zabruder's office, the president was pronounced dead. And uh, we heard the report saying that he had been wounded, uh, seriously wounded, perhaps fatally wounded. And Mr. Zabruder was telling me, he said, no, he's dead. I know he's dead. I was watching through my viewfinder and his head exploded like a firecracker. He said he could see blood parts of his brain you know, uh, come, out, come out of his head. And so he was confident. Television news did not report that he was dead, but Zabruder knew he was dead. And I accepted Zabruder's uh, viewpoint. And I think it was probably when I was up there they finally said that he was pronounced dead. It was quite traumatic for me. For one thing, I had, I had covered him, uh, I mean, I had supported him as a voter, as my first vote being given to him, and, uh, but I was helped by the fact that I was busy. And I think all reporters suffered less from trauma because they were busy trying to cover the story. And so I think uh, that helped me get through that very dark day. Um, what was the impact on Dallas? Dallas, Dallas was uh, devastated. Dallas had been fearful that something might happen because there had been extreme right-wing demonstrations against Adlai Stevenson just a month before. Adlai Stevenson had been disrupted at a UN Day speech. He'd been hit on the head with a picket sign. He'd been spat upon. 
And uh, after that incident, Stevenson at first said that Kennedy should not come to Dallas. Uh, the U.S. Attorney, Barefoot Sanders, said he should not come to Dallas. Sarah T. Hughes, a federal judge he had appointed here in Dallas, said he should not come to Dallas. Byron Skelton, a Democratic, uh, state Democratic official, said he should not come to Dallas. But Kennedy, uh, Kennedy was determined to come to Dallas. It was part of his Texas tour, trying to get votes. And so he did come to Dallas. And people were very concerned about what might happen. Nobody expected him to be shot, of course, but they expected right-wing demonstrations that would be very embarrassing. And Dallas was always very proud of its reputation and uh, intended, uh, wanted to look good. But there had been these incidents recently that made it look bad, and so the, the city was on pins and needles. So when the assassination occurred, you can imagine that it was just a very devastating blow. Then, on, on Monday, after or Sunday, after uh, uh, the assassination, Oswald was being transferred to the courthouse, for, uh, to the jail, at the county jail, instead of the city jail, which was a temporary holding place. And he was shot and killed, of course, by Jack Ruby. Now, here Dallas has in its, uh, the Dallas police have uh, the number one suspect, the people that they say, the person that they say for certain killed the president. And while he's in their custody, they permit him to be shot and killed. So the, the fury of the nation was limitless. I mean, letters started pouring in, telephone calls. The mayor was threatened with death himself. And Dallas became just a pitiful uh, subject of derision all over the world. And so, so Dallas was, uh, the reputation was just demolished. And people at that point began examining Dallas. What kind of city is this? What kind of people are they? Why would they have the people who would permit somebody like Oswald to shoot and kill? Of course, the, the thought had been that it would be the right wing that would be responsible for any harm done to the president. It turned out it was a leftist, a Marxist, who did it. And so it didn't come from the direction that we thought. But nevertheless, many people thought a climate of hate had been engendered in Dallas. And, uh, and so Dallas suffered a lot of blame, especially for the fact that not just the president's death, but because Lee Harvey Oswald was killed as well in the police station while he was in police custody. There's also that uh, ad that ran of the Dallas Morning News. The Dallas Morning News, in the morning of the president's arrival, had a rather infamous ad, a full-page ad, saying, Welcome, Mr. President. But it wasn't welcome at all. It was a series of questions and accusations that charged him with being a communist, in effect a traitor to the U.S. And uh, President Kennedy saw it that morning in Fort Worth. And he told, and he, as he told Jackie, he said, we're in nut country now. And he said, the truth is, if there's somebody on top of a building who wants to take a shot at me, there's no way we can stop it. There's no way that can be controlled. So it was a rather ominous foretelling of what happened later that day, not just a few hours later. Did you have any personal experience with people who disliked or even hated Dallas after that event? I did not have any personal experiences with the people who hated Dallas after that, although I'm certain that I did encounter people from out of town. I didn't travel a whole lot then. and. Uh, but I suppose I encountered people who would ask me about the city, but I didn't, I didn't have any of those personally traumatic stories that so many people did have. Do you know um, what effect it had on the Dewey family to be so associated with? I know that uh, Joe Dealey, this I'm, I'm correct on, I think, Joe Dealey and Ted Dealey were there. Joe Dealey was, in effect, head of the newspaper at that time. He had been out of town when the ad had come through, and Ted Dealey had approved the ad. Joe Dealey was very upset and told his father that, gee, I mean, how could we have done that? We invite someone to town, such as Kennedy, and then we insult him with an ad like this. And I think Ted Dealey said, well, okay. Okay, you may start. Uh, Joe Dealey was furious with his father for having accepted that ad. He would, have he would have been the one to pass it on it himself had he been in town, but he had been away. 
And he told his father, how could you do such a thing? I mean, here we've invited the president into town as a guest, and uh, then we treat him this way by running an ad that's so scurrilous. And I think Ted Dealey responded that, uh, well, the ad wasn't a whole lot different than the editorials that we've been running. I mean, we've, we followed that line of thought in the editorials, so why not? And uh, while the ad was very negative, very unfortunate, uh, I suppose the Morning News was exercising freedom of speech in putting in an ad like that and, and opening up its pages to uh, people with those very uh, right-wing extremist viewpoints. What was the motive? My newspaper, the Times-Herald, had been much friendlier to Kennedy and the Kennedy administration. The Times-Herald was seen as a moderate newspaper. And uh, <clears throat> a couple of editorials written by A.C. Green, who was editor of the editorial page, got a lot of attention because they were so thoughtful, reflective. And uh, so the Times-Herald looked good, I'd say, in contrast to the morning news. And uh, as far as the newspaper reporters were concerned, uh, they felt awfully bad about it. And uh, you can say that in general about the newspapers. Anybody would have felt, even the morning news, of course, felt bad about it as well. But everybody felt horrified by it. And there was a sense of uh, disillusionment. I mean, how could this have happened? Uh, why did it happen? Why did it have to ha happen here? And all reporters, for the next weeks, months, dedicated themselves to the Kennedy story. I mean, we tried to follow every angle of it, and so there was a great deal of work done on it. Every reporter at the newspaper worked a great deal on, on every angle that could be found on the assassination. Like what kind of things were you doing? Well, things about Oswald, his past employment, places he had worked, people who had known him, uh, and those sorts of associations. In fact, I remember one story, uh, a lot of these second Oswald stories that came up, uh, like Oswald, whether or not he had tried to rent a car, he had tried out a car at a dealership when he supposedly couldn't drive, but this person who the automobile salesman uh, identified as Oswald said he got in his car and he went with him. They traveled 80 miles an hour or so on the freeway. Was that Oswald? Uh, a rifle range in Irving where someone, supposedly Oswald, had gone to the rifle range and practiced firing shots. Uh, I can't remember now whether that was Oswald or not. It might have been. I don't remember. Uh, all uh, Connections to J.D. Tivitt, the police officer who had been shot and killed uh, by Oswald in Oak Cliff. Uh, the, you know, every, uh, just uh, library books that Oswald had checked out, went to the public library to see if we could get the records, to see what he had been reading, and he had checked out some books. Uh, the, uh, Jack Ruby's past himself, I mean, what he had done, uh, uh, every association we could with Ruby, and those sorts of stories uh, we, we wrote about and researched, and a lot, a lot more than that, I just can't recall all of them. I did meet Jack Ruby, but he was already in custody. <laughs> I had not met him before, and you could say I met him. Uh, he had a couple of, when he was a prisoner, he had I attended two or three of his little mini press conferences at the courthouse. How much did he talk about? At that time, Jack Ruby, uh, and it wasn't long after he was arrested either, but it, frankly, he looked like a nutcase as a reporter covering his press. You would ask him a question, he would go off on a tangent. You could not make a whole lot of sense out of what he was saying, I must tell you. Talked about conspiracy against Jews and all that, and uh, he being one of the victims of that. And he didn't deny having shot him, but I mean, he, he would go on and on and on about something. You could not get a very straight answer out of him. He was so caught up in it. I mean, by the time I saw him, it would have been within a year uh, in those little press conferences. I think probably would have been you know, before his trial. Uh, he was, uh, he was uh, losing his grip, I think. What do, what do you mean, conspiracy against Jews? That, uh, the fact that he was a Jew, it was very nebulous. The fact that he was a Jew uh, was led to some of the charges against him and that he wasn't being treated fairly, something of that nature. It was pretty far-fetched. So did Kennedy's, Kennedy's death affect your outlook on things in any way or what you did after that? 
Well, uh, I, I wouldn't say, I mean, it impacted me as it impacted everybody. I mean, the fact that we were traumatized by it, but I would not want to say that I had a change of heart or anything. I mean, I, I or a viewpoint, major viewpoint. Uh, disillusioned, disheartened, concerned, uh, saddened, all those things. Uh, but it did not change my overall outlook on life, I would say. Okay. Clock. Okay. Now I hate to stray so far from Dealey Plaza. Do you want me to say anything else about, you know, uh, it over the years and the changing of it? Like, for instance, uh, originally when they uh, started, when they moved the levee, and the fact that there were two more streets there, Broadway and Water Street. Do you want me to say anything about that? Yeah. Sure. Or, I mean, whatever you say. Yeah, what was, how did that area It was interesting that, uh, that President Kennedy was assassinated at a place that was so deep in Dallas history because that area, of course, is exactly where the city was founded in 1841. It had been the center of town for many years because the courthouse there, John Neely Bryan had designated that block as the site for the courthouse. Now, originally, before the river was moved in the late 1920s and early 30s, Houston Street, which is now the last street before you get to the triple underpass. Houston Street was not the last street. The next street was Broadway, and the street after that was Water, so-called because it was next to the Trinity River. So when Dealey Plaza was created, when the river was moved and Dealey Plaza created shortly thereafter, those streets were done away with, and they disappeared. But the courthouse area remained the center of town because you had lawyers uh, having their offices right around there, a lot of business was centered around the courthouse, of course. And uh, it remained the center of town for many years. They started, uh, the move away from it started pretty early, however, when the first railroad came through in 1873, 1872, the Houston and Texas Central Railroad, which went down the path, down the route of the HNTC, uh, of the present day Central Expressway. And so you had the train depot down on that end of town, about a mile away from the courthouse. So you did have businesses start gravitating eastward toward that. So you can just talk in normal voice. Okay. I'm gonna. When I start, I'll talk some more about the courthouse area and how long it was, and the Dealey Plaza being part of. I mean, Dealey Plaza not coming along though until thirty-five or so or forty. So it, there's no Dealey Plaza. I don't know why I'd want to talk about that? Well, I'll, I'll I'll get into it. Okay. Of course, there was no Dealey Plaza until late 1930s, early 1940s. That area had been just part of the courthouse square area. You had Houston Street, uh, and then you had two more streets. You had Houston Street, Broadway Street, and Water Street, which was right next to the Trinity River. So all those, those were taken away in the late 30s when they built Dealey Plaza, and they disappeared uh, as streets. And Dealey Plaza was a wonderful gateway into town, uh, very modernistic and thought to be a great improvement because you could come into Dealey Plaza under the triple underpass and you had your option. If you want to go, you could go down Elm, Main, or Commerce. You had all those options. So that seemed to be a great uh, benefit for travelers. Were all of them going two directions? They were all two directions at the time. The, uh, those streets later became, except for Main Street, Commerce and Elm later became one-way streets and Houston Street became one-way too. But until recent times, by recent times, I'm talking about 1970s or so, those, all those streets were two-way. And so in Houston Street, you could go either direction. Same with Commerce and Elm Street. Um, do you know who gave the, the nickname the front door of Dallas? I think that nickname surely came about just at the time that, that Dealey Plaza and the Triple Underpass were created. And that was the design for it to be the front door to Dallas. Up until that point, it had been, uh, oh, rather seedy, I think. There was not a whole lot on Water Street or Broadway. And uh, 
you know, they were not, they did not look good as you came into Dallas. And now suddenly, instead of having just these streets with not much on them, before you got to the courthouse complex on Houston Street, suddenly you get got this nice park-like plaza, Dealey Plaza with those beautiful colonnades on either side, one name for John Neely Bryan, and one name for Alexander Cockrell and uh, and his wife. Uh, so, and, and then you had the the reflecting pools at the front, and then of course ultimately you got the statue of George Bannerman Dealey. So, it was, and and it's always been well maintained, a lot of grass, and uh, quite a lovely area. What about the, the nickname you mentioned before, Big D? Big D. The the nickname Big D came about in the 1930s. And uh, I think it came, and I tried to research this a bit, it came, first started being used just after the centennial in 1936. Before the centennial, Dallas considered itself to be a small, insignificant town and would never refer to itself as Big D. After the centennial, the city started getting a lot of national publicity. And uh, suddenly, I don't know who gave it the name Big D, but suddenly you can see in the Chamber of Commerce literature, they refer to it as Big D. And I, I happen to have a personal story. I remember the first time I ever heard the term Big D. I must have been seven or eight years of age, 1944, let's say, 45. And we lived in South Dallas at the time. I remember being on Second Avenue and hearing two black men talking. Uh, I don't know why I was overhearing their conversation, but I heard one of them in the conversation by saying, well, I've got to go down to Big D now, nodding his head in the direction of the buildings downtown. And somehow, I, I, that was the first time I'd heard Big D, and I remembered it. I mean, I guess I kept hearing it after that, too, but it made an impression on me. It was interesting to me, too, in retrospect, that he was referring to downtown as Big D, not the entire city, because he was already in the city. I've got to go down to Big D, where the buildings were. It, the name was popularized, by the way, further in uh, the musical, Frank Lesser's musical, The Most Happy Fellow. In the 1960s, there was a song in there called Big D. And uh, Big D it mentions Neiman Marcus uh, and landmarks in Dallas. When you think back on it, what is, what's changed the most about Dallas in your lifetime? And what's stayed the same the most? Well, the thing that's changed the most, several things have changed. Of course, you've got the huge buildings downtown. We won't necessarily talk about the physical changes, though, although they're considerable. But one, you have uh, integration of the, uh, the of, of whites and blacks. When I was a boy growing up here, schools were segregated. Uh, and the black communities were spread throughout the town, but they were pretty tight and compact in those little communities. Uh, so that's definitely changed. And the second remarkable thing to me is the arrival of so many immigrants from all around the world. Uh, we have people from, I mean, you, as, as you know, it's no surprise to people nowadays, but we have people from throughout the world. You see them everywhere. Anytime you go into a grocery store, bank, post office, you see people and hear them from all over the world. Uh, and that, when I was younger, a boy growing up, that didn't happen. You had white people, you had blacks, and you had a few Hispanics. Uh, and that would be the diversity that you saw at that time. And, and those were pretty widely separated. And what stayed the same the most? What stayed the, the, the same about Dallas? Well, to me, the changes were gradual. Consequently, it's hard for me to identify a great change. It's always been somewhat the same to me, I guess, since I have family here, friends, uh, and those stay the same, except they <coughs> age naturally, of course. Uh, so uh, I guess I, I don't know what to say about it other than that, really. I mean, do you feel like you still live in the same city that you grew up in? What does it feel like? I feel that thing you can't go home again. I, 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 <laughs> I don't feel as if it's the same city, really. I, uh, in those days, earlier days, uh, it was more compact. It wasn't so far flung. You had little towns out in the county instead of this great metroplex that we now have. You had a limited number of high schools. Uh, it was uh, 
In the days before air conditioning, less than before it became so prevalent, you got outside a lot. On summer evenings, you would go to a uh, root beer stand, you know, in your car, let's say, and go with my parents. Watermelon stand in the summer and eat watermelon. Uh, you'd go outside at night, uh, sit on the porch, and that has changed. Uh, that's definitely uh, different about the city. Uh, the people, you have so many outsiders now, and most of the people, as I grew up in my neighborhood in South Dallas, then I moved to Pleasant Grove when I was 13, uh, the people there were generally, they'd come to Dallas from East Texas. And uh, nowadays, the most, most people you encounter come to Dallas from far away, as I say, immigrants from throughout the world, but others from East Coast, West Coast, and the, and the growth of the huge corporations that we have here course is, is different and that's attracted a lot of people from other places. What uh, factors do you think improved Dallas's image after the assassination? Well after the assassination Dallas for years suffered from this awful reputation and it had a hard time overcoming it. The passage of time always takes care of wounds and heals everything I suppose uh, but there are several things that happened for Dallas. One, economically the city did not suffer as most people anticipated. Despite the bad reputation, the city continued to grow and new business continued to come into Dallas. So it, it, it did fine economically. That was sort of under the surface, however. More than that, the Dallas Cowboys, the football team, had been founded and they were playing even at the time of the assassination. The team was in existence. And shortly after the assassination, it became America's team. All this started having great success and through several strategies, it started getting on television a lot and, uh, and became recognized nationally. And they started winning games and having heroes. And so when you, a sports fan and many other people, instead of thinking of the assassination with Dallas, when they first heard the term Dallas, they thought, oh, Dallas Cowboys football team. Then just after that, another television show came along, Dallas, the, CV, the TV series. Gained great audience gained a great audience around the world too and uh, and I was traveling some by, by this time and uh, and I was sort of there in a transition period when when you would let's say go out of the country someone might ask you uh, if you said you're from Dallas oh you killed the president there huh then after the TV series Dallas came on and after it had been in existence for a few years people started when you said you were from Dallas oh yeah well do you know JR and that sort of thing so the image of Dallas, I mean, suddenly people started thinking about that TV series as well. And then you had assassinations occurring in other cities. Memphis, you had Martin Luther King Jr. assassinated. Los Angeles, you had Robert Kennedy assassinated. People began to realize that, well, this could happen in other cities as well. It doesn't mean the entire city is to blame. And, uh, and people began to recognize that about Dallas as well. So gradually, its reputation was transformed. And, uh, and nowadays, I believe the city pretty much has forgotten the trauma of the Kennedy assassination. I mean, it's put it in the back of its mind at any, at any rate. And it's, ju and it's just not traumatized by that. Do you know when exactly the Cowboys started to become America's team? I think it would be in the mid-1960s that they started were called the Cowboys, the America's team. Well, of course, it's very difficult to say what the world might have been like. Uh, <clears throat> you know that Kennedy was somewhat concerned about Vietnam. He already had a lot of advisors in Vietnam, however. But I think most research indicates that he was not terribly happy about that. He was somewhat distrustful of military estimates because of the Bay of Pigs fiasco. I'm not certain that he would have gone in full-fledged in Vietnam. He did not as LBJ did. On the other hand, uh, he was, and he was working towards civil rights and would con he wanted to do it at a moderate, gradual pace, however. And I think maybe we would have come along a little more slowly in civil rights if he had lived. The assassination sort of jump-started a lot of things in society. And I think the demonstrations that already were occurring 
before the assassination, perhaps picked up steam afterwards. All of society started, you know, you had the turbulent 60s and 70s. So I don't think they would have been as turbulent had he lived. Uh, his death, as some have said, indicated uh, it was sort of the killing of the future. He, he represented the future uh, because he was youthful. He, was, uh, he replaced Eisenhower as president. Eisenhower was sort of a backward-looking individual because of all his past successes as a general. Uh, and Kennedy was looking forward, talking about such things as a new frontier, projecting this useful image. He had push, pushed us toward the uh, outer space and had announced he wanted us to be on the moon, to land on the moon before the decade was over. And so uh, those things uh, we were looking forward to. And uh, those things actually, of course, were achieved, but they were achieved under LBJ, and I think they were given impetus through Kennedy's death. I think everything was speeded up somewhat as a result of that. And uh, there was a sense in society, I mean, his death caused a sense of uh, despair, certainly. And I think uh, it ended an era, a peaceful era. You might say the World War II era, the post-World War II era ended with his death in 63. And the new area that's more familiar to us, the turbulent 60s and 70s, began at that time. What do you know about the story? Well, the Kennedy Memorial, it was debated for a considerable period of time, just what should be done. Uh, but however, right away, a citizens committee was founded of the very top leaders in the city. And that, initially, it was comprised of people like citizens council people. They were all men on the initial committee. I know that. And uh, they started a fundraising drive. And, uh, the, and they, uh, Dawson, W. Dawson Sterling was first chairman of the committee. Uh, then you had John Sholkoff to replace him. Money was raised. They hired the architect, the architect Philip Johnson, uh, and I believe Philip Johnson's from Boston, and devised a memorial. And there's a committee to pass muster on that memorial. And they, ag they agreed on the present design, the one that's there now next to the old red courthouse and the block removed from Dealey Plaza. And uh, they built it and uh, with some mixed reaction, by the way. Some people thought it was too stark and dreary and it was not appropriate. And many people uh, feel the same way now. It's sort of, it is rather stark and has not been very appealing to visitors over these many years, I would have to say. You know how they raised money? Contra they raised money just through contributions. And also it was delayed, the building of it was delayed uh, so that they could put a parking garage underneath it. So they wanted that space. You know, they're going to this this would be one of the most valuable pieces of property in the in the city of Dallas. And I think they did think that before they put a memorial there they should go underground and build a parking lot. So I don't know how those two necessarily were connected, but I know that was a factor in the building of the memorial. It might have been delayed just a bit while they took care of the other. Um, so what are you Personally, I think it's uh, not appropriate. I like the fact that we have a memorial. I think we should have a memorial to the president, but I don't particularly like the one that's there. Uh, I know the idea of the architect is that you go inside the four walls that are standing, you're removed from the noises on the city streets around you, and you look up into the skies, into the heavens, uh, and you have a nice tribute to Kennedy in, in very few words. And so that was the right idea, but it was... Uh, I'd, I'd like to have something, personally, that would be more dramatic and more appealing and that people might I mean, more inspiring, like some of the monuments in Washington, D.C., let's say, like uh, the Lincoln Memorial, which is so wonderful. Uh, the Washington Monument, even. Uh, other, the, the Vietnam Wall is, is so uh, interesting and so appealing. And I don't think we've achieved that in Dallas. Right, yeah. Well, I have noticed a few flowers placed there, I have. And uh, in the 70s, uh, early 60s, a lot of anti-war demonstrations were held there. 
anti-Vietnam War demonstrations. And then in the recent years, it deteriorated somewhat, but the Sixth Floor Museum took it over and uh, they had it re renovated, you know, cleaned up and, and all, and so it, it's looking better these days than it did before. And I understand there has been some talk in recent months about moving the memorial to another site another side in the general area, but moving it off that block, tying it in with a redevelopment plan for the entire courthouse area, which would be a very risky thing, I believe, because Dallas having, the memories aren't that distant. Dallas having suffered from its uh, image and being hostile to Kennedy, let's say, before he came and all the trauma of that, if we now started toying with the memorial and moving it to a less desirable site, and I'm afraid, uh, uh, as far as the image is concerned, that Dallas would not come off too well. Um, what about the story behind the creation of the museum, Sixth Floor Museum? Well, for a while, the Sixth Floor Museum, for a while it was thought, many people thought the site would be forgotten at Dealey Plaza, that, uh, and that the building itself was a ugly reminder of Lee Harvey Oswald and of the assassination and that perhaps it should be demolished. For a while, the building was, uh, it was empty for a while, and D. Harold Byrd on the building, and there was speculation that it should be demolished, and people feared for that for a good while. And, uh, but there were a lot of concerned citizens who thought, no, you can't do that. Ford's Theater was not demolished in Washington, D.C. Uh, you can't do that. And so a citizens group sprang up, uh, dedicated to preserving that building, and uh, Ultimately, they persuaded Dallas County to buy the building and to start using it for Dallas County offices and for the uh, museum itself. Uh, and so that you have the museum in, in part of the building uh, and, and Dallas County offices in the other. What about the resistance to building it? Well, there, there was some resistance, but I don't think it was ever any really serious resistance. There was no concerted effort to let's stop the museum. There, there may have been some people who thought it wasn't a terribly good idea and get, did not get on board with it because they didn't want to forever be associated with the assassination of the president here in Dallas. But I think there was a lot of very uh, influential support in behalf of the museum. So, uh, and and I, I, don't, I don't see the, any dispute over it as being terribly serious. Do you find that it's a place that most Dallas people are interested in or the Dallas people ignore it? Well, it's like most places in your own hometown. I think many people do not, many Dallasites do not go there. Perhaps have been one time, maybe. I've been there any number of times because of my association with the museum, with the assassination. And, but I think it's a place, of course, where out-of-town visitors want to go. I mean, it's, it's, it's very visible and it's, it's high on the list of anybody who comes to Dallas. And so it's been very important in that regard and I think it's a it's been a healing process that people from outside Dallas who want to come and see where the president was killed even though it was 40 years ago now uh, they need a place such as the museum and they definitely come there and, and appreciate it because it's so tastefully done okay <laughs> I have not. <laughs> I haven't had. No, I, but people who come here, and I've had. I've visited with guests who have been there on their own, but I haven't taken anybody there myself. Truth is, but I would if, if anybody wanted to. Do you give tours? I do. I give tours. Uh, Dallas Historical Society, uh, which I'm a member, and uh, I give historical tours for Dallas, and I, I do several. I started off doing several, now I'm just doing one, a historical tour of South and East Dallas. And I have given downtown tours, and, uh, and I would talk about the assassination, of course, and talk about the school book depository, talk about Dealey Plaza, and then go over to Oak Cliff and show places associated with the assassination, the rooming, Oswald's Rooming House and Texas Theater, site where J.D. Tippett was killed. Another thing I heard is that the 
Dealey Plaza areas associated with Bonnie and Clyde that, um, that she used to work with? Oh, yes. Bo of course. Bonnie and Clyde. Uh, Bonnie used to work at a, a cafe right on Houston Street and uh, as a waitress there. And a lot of the sheriff's deputies knew Bonnie. And uh, in fact, uh, one of the restaurants where she worked at, Marco's Cafe, I think was the name of it, Marco's Restaurant, was the father, he was, the owner of the restaurant was the father of my wife, my sister's late husband. So her father-in-law owned the cafe uh, where Bonnie worked there on Houston Street. Where would that be on Houston? It would be towards the Houston Street, but between the Old Red Courthouse and, uh, and towards the Union Terminal, you know, which would be just a couple of blocks there where there's, even today there are a couple of little restaurants there, somewhere in there. So is that Union Terminal, so is that going that's going. On the other side of the, if I'm facing the front of the red. You're facing the red courthouse. It'd be to your right. To your right. Yeah. So just off of the other plaza. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just off of it in that direction. People tend to ignore the statue, I think. Uh, not much thought given to it at all, I would say. But on the other hand, I'm probably not aware of how much thought people might give to it as they come by that site. Out-of-town visitors probably don't know the Dealey name, truth is. How do you feel about that? Oh, it's just natural, I think. I mean, I don't have any... Uh, I, I don't, I see no particular need for them to revere it. I mean, although it's very important to Dallas, uh, I don't suppose you can expect out-of-town visitors to pay a whole lot of attention to it, or Dallas people, for that matter. I mean, there, there's a lot of a statuary around that they pay no attention to, I'd say. Museum? I did visit the Conspiracy Museum once. Uh, I went there, they bought some books. I published a book under my Three Forks Press about the assassination. I published two books about it. And uh, they carried, uh, they wanted to carry the book and I went in and delivered the books there and met the man in charge. And uh, it was just a brief visit, that's all. Because I am not a conspiracy person. <laughs> Do you know anything about the creation of that museum? Wasn't there I, an older one? Yes, there was an older museum, and I don't know uh, how that one got started. There's a whole huge group of uh, assassination buffs who have annual meetings even, and I think uh, in Dallas. And uh, somehow out of all that, they started the Conspiracy Museum because they wanted what they, they, they believed the true story is not being told in the Sixth Floor Museum and wanted to have an outlet for all these conspiracy publications. and. If you've been there, there are tons of publications, and maybe there, there are fewer now. I don't know. I think the excitement has diminished over the years, and the number of people who are involved in studying the assassination have, have diminished. You ever talk with any of those conspiracy people? Who like yes. Sell their books and stuff on Dilly Plaza. Uh, I no, I've only told those people to go away. I don't want to buy their publications. <laughs> I don't ever want to identify myself with those people as having ever been involved in any part of covering the assassination because you don't want to get in conversations like that. Yeah. I don't know how knowledgeable the salesmen are of those publications. Um, yeah. Well, you uh, obviously you were in the area, but did you involved at all when Oliver Stone came to town? I did not at all get involved in Oliver Stone visit. Uh, I was very interested in what he would do, and I was interested in the movie, and I saw the movie, uh, and I was dismayed by the movie because of the license it took. Uh, I mean, it's so many distortions in it that I thought it did a great disservice 
uh, towards history. A lot of things I thought they were so wrong. Oswald became a minor, very minor character and was seen as a patsy. There was a fictitious cre uh, person created in Washington, D.C. who talked about, about the plot to get Kennedy. Unidentified person never happened, of course. It talked about a newspaper being published in another part of the world prior to the assassination, telling about the assassination going to occur. Uh, it was, uh, it of course, did great, lent great credence to Jim Garrison, whose work has largely been discredited. Uh, and it, it, it led to all sorts of doubts in the American public about the assassination, uh, even more so than we had before. Sometimes it's a good thing to stir up those things, but people got it confused with history, and, uh, and it was not. And I don't know that he intended it to be accurate history. And in fact, after the movie came out, they did, uh, a push was put on to release more records, and some of the, I think, uh, information was released after that, and of course that was a good thing. Um, do you know anything about just Oliver Stone's dealings with trying to get the Six Floor Museum? And no, I don't know about that. Did you uh, witness any of that when they were shooting, filming down there? No, I didn't see any of the filming either. No. I was pleased, I was interested to see, however, this small story. When I saw the movie, I saw that my ex-roommate Hugh Fagan played a role in the movie, and he played the Justice of Peace at Parkland Hospital who tried to prevent them from removing Kennedy's body because of state law. State law said a homicide victim had to stay right here. You couldn't take him out of the state. And Hugh did a very wonderful job in portraying that JP. And I had not, not known that he was in the movie, but he was great. I remember that part. <laughs> you do? Yeah. Um, so your feelings? I believe that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone, that he fired three shots from the school book depository, that he was not part of a conspiracy, that if he had been part of a conspiracy, we would have heard about it by now. It is almost impossible to keep a secret of that magnitude. Uh, all his actions, by and large, I think pretty much can be explained. Uh, a rifle, after all, was found on the sixth floor of the school book depository. Palm prints seemed to match him. He obviously was the person who shot J.D. Tippett, the police officer. He obviously was the one person who fled the building afterwards. Uh, he, uh, when he was arrested at the Texas Theater, he tried to shoot another police officer. The officer prevented that just by jamming his thumb in front of the firing pin. And... Uh, he had made a desperate plea the night before the assassination with Marina, his wife. He had gone out to Irving where she was living because they were separated. He begged her to go back to him. She refused. He took off his uh, wedding ring and a considerable amount of money for him, like $100 or so, and left it on that dresser. And then went back uh, and the next morning rode into town to his job at the school book depository. I have the feeling that uh, it was by, he had been an individual who had been greatly disturbed, who tried to make a mark in history. At first, he had gone into the Marines. He had defected the U.S. and gone to the Soviet Union, thought he would become a big shot in the Soviet Union, but they, he did not. They realized he was just a, you know, almost a nobody. So he became uh, insignificant over there. He came back to the U.S. because he had been disappointed there. Uh, he started uh, joining like the Fair Play for Cuba committee and uh, trying to uh, be somebody. And I think this was an effort of a misguided individual to make a mark in history. And I have a feeling that uh, when he went into the building, he, I don't know how he could have ever imagined that he would have escaped. If he's shooting from the sixth floor, and there were people who saw the rifle from the window, of course. He was shooting from the sixth floor, and there were employees in other parts of the building. Uh, how would he, he ever have imagined that he would escape the building? I had a feeling it was almost suicidal. And that if he's, if he's caught, at least he's an important figure, as he thought he was at that point. Uh, 
then he's out and people are wondering where he was going in Oak Cliff after he after the assassination goes to his rooming house, picks up a pistol and his jacket. And my thought, and he only had 20 something dollars left over since he left most of his money with Marina. My thought would be that uh, he didn't know where he was going. He hadn't expected to be free. He wouldn't have expected, he would have expected to have been caught in the building before he could have fled. And that would be my thought. Was there any, ever any point where you had doubts about who was involved? Early on, uh, there were certainly a lot of unusual aspects to it. The visit to Mexico, the Cuban embassy, uh, the second Oswald theories where there seemed to be somebody impersonating Oswald, uh, so there might have been somebody else involved. There were other instances uh, like that, that that certainly made you wonder. And uh, But I pretty much uh, concluded, I have concluded in my own mind that, that, that actually he did it alone. Do you ever think there's anything that can convince other, you know, can convince the people who are looking at conspiracies that, I don't know, do you think that yeah. a piece of evidence could ever emerge that would be accepted? a piece of evidence that would absolutely convict him in the minds of everyone. I don't believe so. I don't think any such piece of evidence will ever emerge. People are still uh, theorizing about Lincoln. People theorizing whether Billy the Kid was actually, Billy, you know, actually was shot and killed himself. Uh, those sorts of things have a life that goes on forever, I think. Uh, there's still people wondering about James Earl Ray, and he may have been in, he may have been involved with some other people, and uh, uh, even people who thought about the killing of Robert Kennedy. I mean, what, the questions arise about all those, and I think they, they naturally arise and will continue to arise. On the other hand, you look at the and this is interesting to me: the assassination of McKinley, 1901. Uh, Forty years after, or fifty years after his assassination, in 1951, let's say, nobody paid attention to the fact that it, it, that marked the 50th anniversary. I have a strong feeling that the 50th anniversary of Kennedy's assassination, there'll be a lot of attention paid to that. So it's interesting how the times have changed. Do you think that's times changed, or just the popularity? I think of what's changed is the media. Actually, when McKinley was killed in 1901, it wasn't on television. There was no film of it. Uh, uh, people relied on the newspaper. There was no radio. So news filtered slowly. I mean, you did read about it in the next day's newspaper, of course, but it didn't have the impact that the assassination of President Kennedy did and the reinforcement of that by the media, which was so prolific and so, uh, so much a part of society at that time. And moreover, it's the image, I think, of Kennedy as the young man whose life was cut short and McKinley being considerably uh, older. Um, what do you think about the efforts to try to rename Main Street? Yeah, some people have thought about renaming it Kennedy Street. I don't like to fool with history that way myself. I like for Main Street to continue to be, <laughs> to be Main Street. I like a certain permanence about such things. Now, naming a uh, school, you know, something new, that, that's great. Uh, I, I think that's fine, but I hate to change a name when it has a history of, of so many years as our Main Street does and all the streets do. And, uh, what do you think the future holds for Jimmy Plaza? Well, I know there are plans right now to redo that whole courthouse area. And I've never seen all the plans, however, and uh, it's a mystery to me, truth is. I don't think many, uh, it's been written about in the paper, but I think rather vaguely. And whether or not it will occur, I don't know. But I hope that Dealey Plaza will remain, itself will remain the same as it has since, say, 1940. Uh, I know there's a proposal right now to sort of redo it even, but they're only talking about restoring it. I mean, working on the concrete and the landscaping and that sort of thing. And that's fine. You have to maintain anything, but I'd like for it to remain the same. Uh, <clears throat> what do you think it will mean to people in the future? Do you think people are still going to come here? 
I think people will continue to come here uh, in Dealey Plaza, even though the people who come here now, so many of them weren't even born when Kennedy was president, when he was assassinated. And I, sus I suppose people, I, I, I have a feeling after every 10 year, year anniversary, however, that the attention will be less than it had been before. And uh, I would have a feeling that after the 50th anniversary, that there will be less attention paid to it. Because I think there will be a, a pretty big uh, memorial on the 50th. But thereafter, I have a, I mean, so many things will have happened. I think it will fade into the past. But it'll still be there, uh, uh, just as uh, Ford's Theater is there in, in Washington. I think it'll still be there. People will still come to it as a historical place, but I think the numbers certainly will be fewer. The impact on the population, the um, general public? Because, yeah, and the, the allure of the, the mystery of it. And the I think that the, the mystery of it, the conspiracy theorists, uh, have already uh, diminished in numbers, I think. I think that is, is dying down. It's my feeling. Maybe there are things happening that I'm not aware of, but I think uh, the attendance at these uh, conspiracy uh, reunions that they've been having, I think it's dwindling. They're selling fewer books, and they had a number of publications devoted to this. I think they're selling fewer and fewer. And so I think that that's uh, gradually dying down. I'm just going to look back and see if Okay, go ahead. Missed, go ahead. Is there anything you can think of? That's... I'll think about it. Let me think okay. here. Uh, Okay, let me say a few things about the area. About Dealey Plaza, the fact that the Union Terminal used to be very busy and, and the deterioration of that courthouse area. Can, can we go ahead and say it? Yeah. Uh, it used to be Dealey Plaza being part of the courthouse complex uh, and the courthouse complex was a very busy part of town. And that, one of the reasons it continued to be a busy part of town for many years was because of the Union Terminal, the train station that was built just the next block, opened in 1916, and you had lots of trains coming in, discharging passengers and taking on passengers, so it was a beehive of activity. When we lost our last, I think there's one Amtrak, Amtrak train coming in now, but, but train, the train business is no longer very prevalent down there, so people started going away. after. World War, sometime after World War II, when aviation started replacing train travel, the courthouse square area, including Dealey Plaza, uh, started deteriorating. There was not as much activity, and some of the buildings in the surrounding area deteriorated, and it was seen as a place, part of town that needed reviving. When the Dallas Morning News built its new building there in 1946 or 47, uh, it was said to be a commitment to the courthouse area that they wanted, they, they were putting their confidence in it and they were voting for it and so that helped a lot. And uh, with the Sixth Floor Museum there it's helped, helped a lot too act, as far as activity is concerned. But for a good while they were concerned about that area and its deterioration. What do you feel when you go down to that area now? Uh, when I go down there, I, I always think about the assassination. Uh, it, uh, I suppose I never pass it, uh, and I pass it very frequently without the thought occurring to me. And I think perhaps that's because you see people there all the time on the street. You can see their spectators who come in or visitors looking for it. I thought after the assassination, for the first 10 years or so, well, at the very beginning it was very much on my mind. Then it sort of disappeared you know, as a factor in my mind. And then people, uh, as the years passed on, suddenly uh, you realize this is going to be lasting, you know, that people will continue to ask questions about it and uh, about your involvement in, in covering the assassination, let's say. So uh, it, it seems in my own life, it's loomed larger <laughs> rather than smaller, strangely, even though I've done a lot of other things and it's not as terribly significant part of my life, but it is the thing that so many people keep reminding me of. Um, you know about the, the X, the Space 
Frank had an X in the street around about the spot where Kennedy was shot. When they do that? I've, well, I've been told that the city keeps removing it and people keep putting it in Oh, the yeah, I've never seen one of those X's, but... Uh, yeah, I saw it down there the other night. Is that right? Yeah. And also, uh, what I find was really interesting is that plaque that's on the wall on, mm -hmm. the, administ on the administrative Dallas County Administration yeah. building where it says that this is where Harvey right. Oswald allegedly shot. And people are like underlining the allegedly. They're like engraving into the metal. They want it, uh, they're emphasizing or are trying emphasizing to? Emphasizing the, the allegedly. I see, yeah, a lot of the conspiracy people. Most of the people, most of the American public believe in a conspiracy. And I think that's still true. Most of them think that one little lonely individual could not have committed such an act that changed the course of a nation and are not unwilling to accept that fact. Now, I've heard others say, including the historian Robert Dalek, who spoke at the Sixth Floor Museum a few weeks ago, saying that, no, he did not believe in a conspiracy because he said if, 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 there, if you had a conspiracy, there had to be some well-organized people who could keep a secret that long, who could do all these things. Would such a group of people pick such an individual as Lee Harvey Oswald to do the deed, who had been a misfit who, all his life, who was not a stable person? I mean, if you're that organized, that you'd go for somebody else, I think, to do that. And that was Dalek's take on it. I don't think I can think of any other questions. Okay, great, great. All right, All right sure. Much. Sure, Jamie, glad to do it. Uh, hope some of it works out.